So this is problem 7.25 of Griffith's fourth edition. The problem reads, try to compute the self-inductance of a hairpin shown in figure 7.38. Here we're going to neglect the contribution from the ends and most of the flux comes from the long straight section. Of course, you'll run into a snag that is characteristic of many self-inductance calculations. Now to give an answer, to give a definite answer, assume that the wire has a tiny radius epsilon. This is not to be confused with your epsilon in your electric fields in matter, where in your epsilon was defined as your permittivity of your medium. Okay. Now here we're also going to ignore any flux through the wire itself. Okay, so how does it look like? So, so as mentioned in the figure, the hairpin would look something like this. Uh, okay, so that it is composed of, uh, sorry, this is composed of this wire. This wire, this wire, this wire, and okay, so a hairpin looks something like this. Okay, you imagine that. Okay. So the, let's say that the total length of the hairpin is L. Okay, sorry. Let's use small L. Okay, and the distance between the hairpins is B. Okay. Now what, how do we compute for the self-inductance? Anyone? So to compute for the self-inductance, we need to calculate the L. And how do we calculate L? Hmm? So remember that uh, self inductance L is related to your uh, current and your flux wherein the flux is equal to L times I. Sorry, I. Okay. So we need to calculate the current, uh, the magnetic flux V as a function of I to get the self-inductance L. So what happens here is uh, this wire produces a magnetic field and that induces a current on this wire. At the same time, this wire also induces a current, uh, also produces a, its own magnetic field, induces a current here. Okay, and that is what we call self-inductance. Now, as mentioned here, we are going to consider the tiny radius of the wire. Okay, so let's say this is your wire okay and let's make it a little big so we're going to use a small section of this wire okay and another one okay so this wire Sorry. 
part of this wire. This wire is a part of this wire. Okay, so we're looking for this small section. Okay, so our epsilon here would be uh, the tiny radius given by uh, this amount. Okay, this is the central axis. Okay, so this small radius would be epsilon. Tama ba? Yes. Now this to this would be D. Okay. So that means uh, this to this, oh, sorry, this amount to this is D minus epsilon. So how important is this? What we, what we want to do is when this uh, current wire considered to be long produces a magnetic field, the, we, we're going to consider a general point away from this wire. Let's call this S. And then we're going to integrate between this between uh, between epsilon. So this is epsilon to epsilon d uh, d minus epsilon okay so the magnetic field due to one wire so the magnetic field due to a long wire as we uh, learned before is equal to mu naught times i over 2 pi s so therefore the flux of one wire to the other would be simply flux. So this is, let's say, produced by one. Let's say this is one. This is two. Y1 and Y2. So the flux uh, produced by Y1 would be equal to the mag uh, integral of the magnetic field dot dA. And what is EDA? If we're going to set this as uh, this is our L, sorry. Okay, so this whole area this whole area Or, sorry. So this whole area would be DL ad S a D S times L. So this is your infinitesimal area. So again D A D A would be L okay and the mag and because the area element here is perpendicular to this screen and the magnetic field due to a long wire on this side is also perpendicular to the screen. Therefore, their dot product will be a simple multiplication. So this is now equal to integral of 
u naught i over 2 pi s times l ds, which is written as mu naught i l over 2 pi. And then integral of ds over s. So in this case, our limits of integration will be from e uh, epsilon to d minus epsilon. So this is now equal to so the total flux will be twice the flux of this of one of one wire because this flux this wire also produces the same flux here so this is twice so this is equal to uh, two times this so this is two will cancel here so this is mu naught i l over pi times ln of d over epsilon over epsilon. Now, because we have a very tiny radius, so that means epsilon is much, much less than t. Okay, so that means this ratio becomes D over E. So that means our flux will now be equal to mu naught I L over pi times ln of D over epsilon. So therefore, the inductance of this hairpin loop is equal to n over pi times ln of d over x. So as you will notice here that the self-inductance only depends on the size. And what am I talking about? It depends on uh, the distance between the hairpin, the radius of the hairpin, as well as the length of the hairpin. Okay? So this same dependence on size or geometry is the same dependence on size and geometry when you have your resistors and even your capacitors. That's why your resistance, capacitance, and inductance or self-inductance are all intrinsic properties of your devices. Whether or not you apply a potential difference, electric field or magnetic field on them, their capacitance, inductance, and resistance will remain the same as long as their dimensions and material are the same.